Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Shift. If this is your first time here, we're so excited to have you. Make sure you scan the QR code and fill out that Connect card so that we can send you some free Opus coffee. And if you have any questions about what Shift is or what we do, make sure you check out the coffee with dough option. Baxter! Make sure you check out the Coffee with Joe option so that you can ask any and all questions that you want or need to know. Our book group is reading through the book, Falling Upward by Richard Rohr. They meet on Wednesday evenings and they discuss a chapter or two. And if you've ever heard Joe, my father, teach, then you've definitely heard of Richard Rohr or you've definitely heard of the book. It's not too late to plug in. So if you're interested, you can scan this QR code or the one at the Welcome Center fill out the form and a leader will contact you. Our next games group is gonna be on October 20th from 3 to 4.30 p.m. It's gonna be hosted by the DZs. I still don't know how to say your last name, so. Bring your favorite tabletop game. It's a great way to catch up with old friends or meet new ones. If you have any questions or if you need more information and for directions, make sure you email Angela at shiftgnb.com. The next shift meetup will be at the Black Adder on October 7th at 7 p.m. for their MCU Trivia Night. And they're even gonna be doing a costume contest if you feel so inclined. Make sure that you RSVP to Mackenzie Butler or Sandy Frankenberger through our Facebook Virtual Campus. And if you're not a part of our Facebook Virtual Campus, let us know and we can send you an invite. And that's it for this week. And now on to week one of our new series, Kingdom of God. Anyway, good morning. Uh, it is uh, good to be back together, whether uh, in person or online. And if you're new, my name is Joe and I help lead shift. And last week, we, last weekend, we didn't meet in person because we had an amazing um, time at the Pride Festival. Um, and I don't know how many people uh, we interacted with over the eight hours, seven to eight hours that we were there, but it was a, it was a ton of fun. And um, it was a, it, we weren't sure if it was going to happen because of, you know, like, the terribleness of of Hurricane Helene, but it was it was like a really good coming together after all of that, and it was like just this small reminder that that there is good that happens even in the midst of of junk like Helene. Uh, today we're starting a new series. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at something that Jesus called the kingdom of God. Um, but before we do, um, if you're comfortable, I would invite you to close your eyes and take a few deep cleansing breaths just in through the nose and out through the mouth inhale and then exhale and as we go through this if you need to you can always return to your breathing and as you do begin to allow your body to relax and let your mind go to where it needs to. Let me gently encourage you to lay down whatever came before this. And to keep whatever is coming for later. Take a moment to set your intention for our gathering today. What is it that you need from me? And what is it that you need from this time? Take note of the things that come to the surface that really stand out, that resonate with you. And as they show up, meet those with love and curiosity. Continue to breathe in and out and slowly come back to the space as you breathe. And when you're ready, I invite you to open your eyes.
if you if you grew up in church or anywhere near the Bible Belt, then you may remember the phrase "born again Christian." Anyone? Anyone? Yes. Anyone ever use it? It had like this exclusive feel to it, this tone, like, are you a Christian or are you a born again Christian? Like it came with a decoder ring or something. Um, I, and setting, uh, setting aside all kinds of silliness, uh, an issue that I have with the idea of being born again is that it conveys a momentary uh, transaction. It's something that happened and then it's done like birth. My wife gave birth to our two kids. It was a moment in time that occurred and will never occur again. It was May 2nd and July 29th. Those were the dates. And being born again for good or bad kind of carries with it the same implication. And we believe that because it's practiced that way. Like you would say a prayer or you would affirm a set of certain beliefs or dogmas and then boom, you're saved. Right? Like, here's your ticket to heaven. And that's it, I guess. Is that, and is that what Jesus kind of showed up for? And that phrase, uh, born again, is found in a conversation uh, between Jesus and a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus. And it's recorded in John 3. Nicodemus is uh, a Pharisee, he is a religious leader. Um, he's part of the ruling religious class during that time period. And he comes to Jesus under the cover of night because he couldn't risk his position by being seen with Jesus. And come to think about it, there's still a lot of religious leaders acting like that today. Sorry. I, sometimes I just can't help myself. That's fine. But John 3, John chapter 3, starting with verse 2. Uh, he came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these things or do these signs that you do unless God is with that person. Jesus answered. And very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Now, many translations choose to render uh, that verse three as born again rather than born from above, which I believe is the reason that drives some of the confusion. Not that not that the phrase born again is wrong per se, but it misses something profound. Because what if Jesus is pointing us towards something far deeper than just a simple transaction? And so today I want to take a look at this passage, not as a prescription for a transaction, but as an invitation into an ongoing transformation. One that reorients us to see and experience the kingdom of God, not in some far off heaven, but right here in our midst. So when Jesus tells Nicodemus, that he must be born from above. He's not talking about a single moment of belief. The Greek word used here is anothen, which both means from above and anew. And Jesus is inviting Nicodemus and all of us into a new way of being in the world, one where our old ways of seeing and living and loving are transformed by the Spirit of God. And the early church leader, Paul, even echoes this in his letter uh, to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. So if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. So this idea of being born from above and becoming a new creation are interconnected. Both are about a radical reordering of our lives, one that impacts not just our beliefs, but how we see and move through the world. I have so many conversations with people about what we should and shouldn't think about God, what we should and shouldn't believe about God. And I've come to a realization that I'd like to share with you. I think that's just silly. I think it's silly. And I use that word on purpose. I think it's absolute, absolute silliness that we have decided that the most important thing about God is what we think about God. That's absurd. Absolutely absurd. And this idea of salvation or being born again, right? That it's a singular moment based on our thinking of the divine feeds into that silliness. Like, how dare we turn this thing into a simple transaction? The proclamation of the good news of the kingdom is not a transaction. It's transcend. It's transcendence, right? It's uh, incarnational. 
it's transformation. And we do the faith of Christ great harm when we reduce it to just like a spiritual version of Walmart. Instead of, instead of being securing our individual salvation or making sure that we're like on the right side of this heavenly transaction, being born from above is, is about seeing and experiencing the kingdom of God. It's entering a new consciousness where we begin to perceive God's presence and God's work in places that we never saw before. Now, much of modern Christianity is really focused in on that idea of salvation as a ticket to the afterlife. But Jesus consistently speaks of the kingdom of God, not as something distant or future, but as something present among us. Look at his words in Luke 17. Jesus says, the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. It's recognizing that the kingdom of God is breaking into our world here and now through our acts of love, acts of justice, acts of mercy. So when we're born from above, we no longer wait for the kingdom as a future promise, but participate in it as a present reality. Now, most of you know, I think most of you know that I spent, I spent probably the, well, not probably, I spent the majority of my like church career, if you want to put it that way. Um, and student ministry. And there are a lot of things that I would do differently if I could go back and start over. Um, but I think the biggest thing that I would change if I could go back and do it all over is how much emphasis was put on behavior modification. So if you participated in a youth group, you know exactly what I'm talking about, because that's what youth ministry was. If I could get you to, be to behave in certain ways, like Christian ways, right, then, then we were doing a good job. Parents wanted their kids to behave like Christians, because if they behave like Christians, you know, in these certain ways, then they could rest assured that their kids were going to heaven. They weren't as concerned about like this deeply transformational kind of faith that we're talking about. And the pushback to that would be, of course, I want my students to be transformed, right? That would be the pushback. But in my experience of almost 20 years, the overwhelming majority would mean that transformation being seen in a behavioral change. Now, that is not a slam or dig at any parent, okay? Because any parent would want that. Any parent would want their kids behaving in certain ways. So it's not a bad thing. So I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is that it can be detrimental when we reduce faith to just that behavior change. But I played into that idea as much as anybody did. If your kids behaved better because they were in my youth group, it was a huge win, huge win. And it was also like, it was covering my rear a little bit because it was like, if something happened down the line and it always did, because it's youth ministry, uh, your kids are awesome. You're welcome. And so it was kind of like uh, job security as well. It reflected on my ministry and reflected on me as a person. And I would use, there were certain passages that you could use to kind of really reinforce this idea. And here's one, Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And we would use that to make your kids or you behave a certain way because renewing your minds is different from the world. You're not supposed to go to the parties. That's what Paul said. You can't go see rated R movies and listen to rock music. Paul is saying you're not supposed, that's not what he's talking about. Renewing our minds is not just a simple behavior change so we can get into heaven. It's a shift in how we engage with the world. To renew our minds or be born from above is to resist the ways, the, uh, resist the ways of the world that are driven by fear, that are driven by greed, and driven by power. Instead, we're called into a kingdom vision where love and justice and mercy are the central values. So that leads us not only to just this personal renewal, but also into the larger work of justice around us. Take uh, Dr. James Cone. Uh, he is a theologian, a black liberation uh, theologian. He is also the author of this. Uh, can you go ahead and show this next one? Yeah, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. If you have not read this, I cannot recommend this more, especially for those of us uh, that come from white evangelicalism. 
Um, I could not recommend you read this more. In his writings on Black liberation th theology, Cohn argues that salvation is about liberation from oppression and the restoration of all uh, of dignity to all people. So salvation isn't uh, just about an individual's relationship with God, but about the collective work of setting uh, free those who are bound by injustice. So again, it's not something far off that we're looking forward to. It's something present that we participate in. And that idea of the kingdom, that idea of salvation is supported by Jesus in places like four, Luke 4, verse 18, where Jesus stands up and says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. So being born from above is so much more than us just changing our behavior. It's so much more than just some sort of spiritual Walmart transaction where now I get to go to heaven because I, I bought the about the extended version. And it's much more than just an individual experience that we have like at the end of a sermon. It's opening our eyes to the ways in which God's kingdom is about freeing the captives and healing the broken. Salvation, hear me when I say this, salvation is not about securing our personal passage to heaven, but about entering into a collective rebirth where we work alongside God to heal the world. Last weekend was uh, the Gainesville Pride Festival. We got some pictures here of it, um, was the Gainesville Pride Festival. Um, like I said earlier, we for those of us that are on the board that were part of the planning, we really weren't sure if this was gonna happen. There was a lot of scrambling. We had to wait until um, Thursday to make the call. Like, is it gonna happen? Is it not? Yes, tentatively, we're going to, we're going to do it, and then um, and then we got the word that Bo Diddley was okay, that the city had resources for us, like the police officers that we hired, and it was a it was a go. And there were a gazillion people that were there, and it was awesome. Oh, not this part. J leave it there, though. This part was not awesome. I'll get to it in a second. There was a gazillion people there, and it was so much fun. We gave away, I don't know, what did we say? How many ring pops was it? Like a almost a thousand ring pops we gave away. And um, all these little trinkets and stuff. And um, it, it was a, it was a lot of fun, a lot of stickers. And I just want to first thank everybody, um, whether you're here in person or online, that that were part of that, that gave to that to help make that happen. And then a special shout out to Christina Dimchek for the, the decorations and the Ohana theme. Then came the hate preachers who showed up with their usual stick. Shtick. But it's old. And kind of boring if they need to come up with some new material. But it was really, really loud. I don't know if you can see behind the tall guy with the awesome shirt, there's a sound system. And the sound system was louder than the stage at times. And it was so loud that the people right there in front, like um, supervisor of elections, um, moms against um, gun violence, is that what they're called? Moms against, is that what it's called? The group, yeah, I think that's the official name. They they couldn't hear conversation. We had to call GPD over and over and over with noise complaints for them to finally come and, and say, hey, you have to turn that off. It, it's it's too loud. Um, but they did. And um, then we could actually hear, which was great. And their whole agenda was to show up and to save people. And I use that in quotations. It was to save people. They wanted people to have like a conversion experience. And then they would upload that conversion experience to YouTube because they had their little camera on one of the sides. So I reached out to the shorter one, the little guy. His name is Michael. And uh, I had a conversation with, with him last year. And I thought I really regretted not getting his contact information because I wanted to talk to him. So this year when I saw that he showed up, I didn't have any conversations with him about anything. But he remembered me and I said, hey, let me take you to coffee. And he said, uh, he said, no. And I'm like, you're not willing to talk? And he's like, no, I'm not a friend with sinners. <laughs> it's like, I'm, like, I'm like, I'm not asking you to be my friend. I have plenty of friends. I don't need any more friends. <laughs> I said, I'm just, I just want to sit down and have a conversation. I said, I just want to hear your story. I said, I went to your website and I said, it was interesting. And so I'd like to hear more of your story. 
And so next Saturday, the 19th, I think it's, I think that's next Saturday. No, in two Saturdays, two Saturdays, um, October 19th, I'm going to meet him at five o'clock and we're going to sit down and have a conversation. Now I'm guessing, now I'm not going to try to convince him of anything. That's not, I, I'm, that's a waste of time. But I'm guessing that all that Michael experiences, especially in places like this, but not just here, like in his life period, I think all that he experiences is anger. And rightfully so here, right? Like th that external anger, but I think that all he experiences is anger. And if I believe that, if I believe that salvation is about entering into a partnership with God to heal the world, then it has to mean in places like that with people like him. But let me say this before we move on. I have the ability to do that. I, I can do that. I can sit down with him from a place of safety. And not everyone can do that, nor should they try. But the mistake that they make is the mistake that so many make. They see this idea of salvation as one and done. Like, pray with us here, and then that's it. You're good. But being born from above, yeah, you can get rid of it now. But being born from above is not a destination. You don't arrive, and there it is. It is a lifelong journey that can never stop. If we ever get to the point where we say, that's it, I've got it, I got to figure it figured out, then we turn into those guys. That's who we turn into. Maybe, maybe not that in your face with it, but once you say you've got it figured out, it's the exact same mindset. And I don't say that from a place of arrogance, but I do say it from a place of genuine heartache because I have experienced that before. As uh, Richard Rohr, who we have the book study that's happening right now, contemporary theologian, Franciscan priest, uh, wrote in his book, Falling Upwards, that spiritual growth is a continual process of death and rebirth. Death and rebirth, undoing and remaking. In your undoing, you are remade. To be born from above is to be continually invited into deeper levels of understanding, of learning to let go of ways of being and embracing new ways of living in God's kingdom. So our spiritual journey is not linear. It is an ongoing process of falling and rising, continually being reborn as we grow into deeper union with God and then with the world around us. And it's going to be this understanding of salvation as a dynamic and lifelong process that echoes the call of Jesus to Nicodemus of that conversation that we started with. He was being invited to be born from above to experience the world through new eyes, and so are we. Constantly, continually being invited to experience the world through new eyes, to see the kingdom of God at work, and then to join in its ongoing revitalization of the world. Now, the hardest part about this, let's be really honest. Can we be like super honest? I think the hardest part about this is that it sounds like a lot of work. It sounds like work. And I'm told another undoing, another book to read, another thing to volunteer at, another something to take up more of my time. And there is a grain of truth to that because this idea of being born from above is not without its own work. It is a process that must happen. Like if we're going to do this, it is a process. It's a metamorphosis, if you will. Metamorphosis. When it when a caterpillar enters its chrysalis, it begins something called histolysis. But basically, what happens is when uh, many of their old tissues are dissolved into like this like this nutrient rich soup, uh, and not everything gets broken down, not everything gets undone. Um, there's a certain group of cells called imaginal discs that remain intact. And they use the dissolved material to develop the caterpillar's new body. So while it seems like the caterpillar is completely undone, key parts are preserved to facilitate the rebirth. It's just a natural process that happens. The caterpillar cooperates with the process by creating its surroundings 
and then it just does what it does. So will you need to do some work to cooperate with this process? Yes, there will be some work that you'll have to do, some internal work and some external work. But then, just like the caterpillar, you allow the process to take place. And I don't believe that God is asking for more work. I don't believe God is calling us to any more things. If anything, I believe that God, I believe that this is about stripping away the things that stand in our way. I think it's more about the undoing. It's us learning to be still. It's us learning to quiet our thoughts and quiet our hearts, learning to center ourselves on eternal things. And this week, like we've been doing, each day at 7.30 in the morning, it's going to pop up on the virtual campus. If you're not part of that, let me know. We can send you an invite. But there's going to be these short readings at 7.30 that, that's going to pop up. And each, each, each day will help you. It's just a short reading. I don't even know if it takes five minutes to read it. But it's just one little way of helping you practice this stillness, practice participating in your own undoing. This is what we mean when we talk about the work of being born from above. It's setting down checklists, setting down your doctrines, and setting down your dogmas. Your work is to get your environment internally and externally ready for your undoing so that it's conducive to what the Spirit is going to do in your life. Because the Spirit, she is always willing to start the metamorphosis, always ready for renewal. Your biggest work in all of this is to allow the process of rebirthing from above to begin. Your job and the encouragement for today is to be ready to cooperate with her. If you're new, we end each gathering with a time of observation and reflection. And we do that to allow you time to listen to your body and then to listen to the spirit. And so the band will come back up um, to play so it's not an awkward silence. And then um, we'll turn the lights down here in just a second um, to uh, kind of create a bit of a bit of intimacy. And I'm going to ask you a few questions to guide the process. And then I'll pray. And we'll have a time for any that are willing to um, take the communion, which are the small cups in your seat. And each week we reflect on what we've heard and thought about and kind of walked through. And so today, let it remind us of the deeper ways of living and being found in this kingdom, found in this born from above. So like we began our gathering, I invite you to close your eyes and to take a few deep breaths. Allow yourself to feel what you need to feel. My first question for you today is what was your intention for this gathering? What did you need from me? Did those things come to you? And if so, what are they saying? If not, why not? And what is that saying? What does it mean to you that salvation is not a one-time event? How does that change your understanding? If the kingdom is a transformative vision of what life with God looks like on earth, what does that look like for you? My final question for you today is this. How have you strayed from that path in living out this transformation? And what parts of your life have you left that way of living? And then how can you get back on that path?
Pray with me. Author of Transformation, we are thankful for this time together, whether in person or online. Thank you that we live in a time and a place where we can freely delve into this mystery of being born from above. Open our eyes to see the possibilities of this new, old way of living and being. Give us the endurance and the tenacity it takes to shed unhelpful ways of understanding. Thank you for Jesus and how he lived this out to show us the way. And I pray that you'd forgive us for things done and for things left undone. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Bring comfort to the afflicted, healing to the broken, and freedom to the chained. In the name of the one who shows us the way. Amen. All right. Let me let me pray this benediction, and then we'll get out of here. And then, hey, you guys be safe. Be safe. Reach out to your neighbors. Make sure everybody's ready to go. All the good things. Just be a good neighbor, right? And if, if anybody needs a place, then holler. May the spirit of transformation stir within you, awakening new possibilities and renewing your heart. As you journey from this place, may you be reshaped by grace, living as co-creators of justice and love. May the winds of change guide your steps. The light of Christ illuminate your path and the God of all renewal keep you ever unfolding, ever growing, and ever becoming. Go in peace to transform and be transformed. Amen. Get out of here. Go love on some people.